Morning, everyone. And thank you all for joining us for today's program, U.S. Policy in the Arab World, Perspectives from Civil Society. I am Joshua Haber, the Research Associate at the Middle East Task Force at the New America Foundation. And I am very delighted uh, to welcome you all to this very unique and distinguished panel of researchers and activists representing different countries in the Middle East region. I would, in particular, like to thank the Arab NGO Network for Development for co-sponsoring this event. And I should also mention that this is the second time that we are hosting the delegation at New America. So welcome back, everyone. Now, at a time when the Arab world is undergoing difficult and stalled political transitions, uh, international attention is uh, mostly focused on the grand showdown between governments and peoples, between regime and opposition, and between Islamists and secularists. But much less attention is paid to the activities that Arab civil society organizations are undertaking at the grassroots level to defend and advocate for the rights of the region's most vulnerable. They are defending citizens facing repression and discrimination, providing humanitarian relief to citizens in need, especially in Syria and surrounding countries, and advocating for the social and economic rights of those suffering the most under the present conditions. But, of course, as civil society organizations face many obstacles and must confront the challenges of operating in repressive and sometimes violent uh, domestic political environments. Moreover, many groups lack sufficient international support. So one key question that we will discuss today is how can the United States and other countries more effectively support the work and initiatives of civil society organizations in the region? In this discussion, we will also uh, more broadly uh, evaluate U.S. policy toward the region from a civil society perspective and discuss the ways in which these policies um, impact the socioeconomic conditions of Arab citizens. Uh, we have a broad array of issues uh, to cover, uh, but first I would like to briefly introduce each of our uh, panelists. Uh, to my right, um, immediate right, Mahinur al-Badrawi, is a research officer at the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights, where she focuses on human rights violations and the role of international financial institutions in Egypt. She holds a bachelor's degree in political science from the American University of Cairo and is currently pursuing a master's of law degree in international human rights law at AUC. Uh, Mohamed Lutfi is a, a senior advisor on strategic policies and inclusive development of the Lebanese Physical Handicapped Union, and he has been a leading advocate for the rights of disabled individuals, especially in the Middle East, for more than 15 years. He has worked with uh, local organizations in Lebanon, his country of origin, representing youth with disabilities and with international organizations such as uh, the, the Bank Information Center, the Asian Blind Union, and the World Blind Union. Uh, Mohammed is currently pursuing a PhD in anthropology at the American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, Rana is a Syrian researcher and consultant for the United Nations, uh, including at the, the UN Development Programs, the Bureau for Development Policy, and the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. In her various activities working at the grassroots level, Rana has focused on Syrian civil society youth empowerment, social protection, and poverty elimination. Kinda Mohammadia is the policy advisor at the Arab NGO and Network for Development, where she works on issues related to social and economic rights, development policies, trade and investment agreements, and governance issues. She holds a master's of law in international and European economic law, and a master's degree in public affairs from the University of California, Los Angeles. So now I will yield the floor to uh, Kinda as um, she will discuss the work uh, of the AND delegation and the background of some of its priorities. Kinda. Sure. Thank you and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, discussion session on this 
interesting Monday. Uh, so um, uh, a little bit of reflection on the Arab NGO Network for Development and the uh, delegation that uh, Joshua has mentioned. Uh, the ANND is a platform of civil society organizations working across 12 Arab countries. So basically, uh, the network includes seven national networks and uh, more than 200 civil society uh, organizations across these 12 countries. And they work collectively on monitoring economic and social rights and policies in the Arab region. So a lot of our work is uh, uh, basically at the national level in these countries where we follow the uh, status of economic and social conditions and we engage a lot with UN agencies in uh, uh, questioning governments on their uh, obligations under international human rights law, specifically at the economic and social uh, uh, front. But one of the areas that we have been developing uh, uh, in the last uh, several years is monitoring the uh, relations, especially the economic relations between Arab countries and the European Union and Arab countries and the United States. So specifically through trade and investment relations, through financial and development assistance. Uh, and we monitor these relations uh, 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 specifically from the perspective of their implications on the economic and social uh, rights and economic and social conditions in uh, our countries because as we all know in our uh, uh, world today it is the way the global economy is being governed and the way we are designing our uh, interface and uh, uh, legal commitments with other countries uh, uh, under the umbrella of trade and investment relations that is very much influencing how our national economies as well are developing and how much our national economy are able to respond to the developmental challenges that citizens face. We see this is uh, central to the uh, challenge we have as a civil society network because uh, uh, this is an area of work that uh, uh, requires us building uh, partnerships across uh, the Mediterranean with European organizations and across the Atlantic with US-based organizations. And this is exactly what we have with the uh, New America Foundation, specifically the Middle East Task Force at the New America uh, Foundation. We uh, try to uh, work with NAF to bring voices from the region who can reflect on the uh, uh, challenges of different stakeholders and the priorities from their perspectives, and also to reflect on how the US relations with Arab countries can accommodate and more effectively respond to, uh, 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 to these uh, challenges. This is basically generally on the Arab NGO network. The uh, delegation that is facilitated by ANND comes from different Arab uh, countries. This is the second year we have organized such a delegation to Washington, and we have uh, uh, more experience in, in facilitating delegations to the European institutions, to Brussels specifically. So we do this every year. And uh, our main aim is to, one, engage with uh, civil society stakeholders, think tanks, researchers and academics that are working on the policy making in the institutions whether in Brussels or in DC but also we are interested in meeting uh, uh, decision makers so here we meet at the uh, State Department level and at the uh, 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 Congress uh, level with the committees that are dealing with issues related uh, to the region. Our main aim is to bring the voices from the region here. We know there's a lot of think tanks, researchers that are dealing with the Middle East issues, but we think the engagement with people who are on the grounds with the people who are interested in doing this uh, work and research, this work is very important and brings a lot of added value. And this, uh, the, this is uh, uh, evolving uh, to being one of the central pieces that, uh, of work that the Arab NGO Network for Development will be organizing every year. So hopefully as well we will have uh, other returns. Just to highlight that um, there is a piece of document outside that, is, that reflects some of the point of views on U.S. foreign policy on the political front and the economic front uh, uh, that the delegation have brought forward, and you are uh, uh, welcome to pick it up on the way out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kinda, for setting the stage for this discussion. And I should say on behalf of the Middle East Task Force that we're, we're just very happy to be collaborating with ANND on so many issues. Um, now, before we get started, uh, just a brief note on format. 
Um, I will begin by addressing specific questions to each of our panelists, and following their responses, uh, we'll enter into a broader discussion of the challenges facing civil society and particularly U.S. policy in the region. Uh, and finally, of course, at the end, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So, uh, Mehinor, I'd like to begin with you. Um, your uh, institute, uh, along with uh, 56, I think, other Egyptian NGOs, uh, just submitted a report to the United Nations that details um, some of the, the priorities and, and grievances of civil society uh, against successive Egyptian governments. Um, so my question to you is, what are civil society priorities in Egypt, and what are your priorities as uh, an NGO? Thank you very much, Joshua. Um, so, my name is Mahinur Radrawi from the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights. Um, well, the, if, if we can hi highlight the major priority of uh, CSOs or civil society organizations in Egypt, um, it would be the uh, partnership for with uh, governments in, uh, in the next uh, period, in a new era after uh, popular uh, revolution and then another uh, wave of revolutions in, uh, in June uh, 30 this year, uh, we see that civil society has a lot to offer to governments that uh, because of a, of a different discourse on what are the priorities of the people, um, we have consec uh, co uh, consecutive revolts in, uh, in, the, na uh, in the nation. So uh, if we can highlight some of um, of what the civil society that worked on uh, a particular uh, outcome document, like uh, the parallel uh, report to the uh, com to the Committee of Economic, Social, and Cultural uh, Rights, the UN Committee, um, I think a, a main message was to uh, mainstream economic and social rights as um, one of the one of the demands of the Egyptians. If we uh, look back in 2011, well, the, one of the first calls of the of the Egyptian revolution was bread, liberty, and social justice. And uh, if we if we um, look, what does that uh, mean? Um, in reality, um, it means. You know the the need to address uh, issues of severe poverty, inequality, um, and regressive uh, means of um, wealth distribution. So, as as far as the as the report, it's uh, given to the fifty first session of the of the committee. It was uh, compiled by the Egyptian Center for Economic and Social Rights. Uh, co-written by uh, 12 uh, CSOs, including uh, some uh, regional like the ANND, for example, international NGOs like the Center for Economic and Social Rights, uh, and other, uh, other uh, 10 other organizations that coordinated the work of the rest of the 55 that formed subcommittees to give their, their input to, uh, to, uh, to this outcome. So, what what was the what was the demand? What did, what did such uh, a, a report? What did such uh, a work of civil society want to say? Well, it said that in um, in the in the time of uh, of crisis. I mean, we cannot. Uh, revolution was uh, great. It reflected um, people's wants and needs and courage. But uh, there is also an economic crisis after it that we cannot uh, we cannot uh, ignore. Uh, but uh, what it said is that the way uh, to deal with the crisis was, uh, in fact, fur uh, furthering the past model of um, uh, that, that, that wasn't uh, c correct or wasn't uh, adding to or was adding to the, the frustrations of the people. So, um, and it, so um, what happened after the of the revolution is that we had economic uh, powers uh, like the IMF, like the G8, uh, trying to contribute to uh, resolving the, the 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 situation in Egypt by promoting austerity measures, by promoting the past uh, method that it tried to uh, deal with the financial crisis uh, with budget cuts. Um, cutting out social uh, security uh, from the people. Uh, 
Uh, but what it, uh, but this reflected into uh, popular discontent on uh, on the ground. I mean, if we can look at uh, the one one of one of the rights that the report highlights, for example, is an adequate standard uh, of living. Uh, Eighty-six percent of the Egyptians reported that their monthly income does not uh, is not does not suffice their food needs or clothes or uh, or shelter. Uh, in the in the meantime. Um, the international financial institutions uh, have been calling to um, further um, cut uh, government support for, um, for, for, for such institutions. The government responded uh, uh, to that because it need, I mean, the consecutive Egyptian uh, governments uh, responded to that in hope uh, possibly for political support from world economic uh, superpowers, uh, maybe political as well, which has uh, resulted in um, an inflation of basic uh, uh, needs uh, prices, like uh, basic uh, food and, uh, and fuel prices and, uh, and such. So, um, what do we what do we really uh, what do we really want what do we really uh, call for well uh, we primarily call on our uh, governments to take a, a different approach to what has been uh, adopted not just in Egypt but also worldwide of making the poor and the vulnerable pay for the cost of crises pay for uh, um, pay for the burden of uh, of reform. I mean, uh, austerity measures and and how they have stirred public discontent is not just in Egypt. Is not just um, you know, the other side of the Mediterranean. We have seen it in Greece. We have seen it in Spain. We're seeing it in Italy. Um, so we call for um, a retake on the on the international. Um, a development uh, agenda that as it outplays uh, in Egypt, we, we say that, you know, economic indicators are not really enough. I mean, in, uh, in the Arab region, particularly in Egypt, we could see in the past uh, few years, even preceding the revolution, that there was a GDP growth, but uh, there was an increasing uh, poverty. Uh, so we, we, we call for uh, progressive uh, taxation, for example, taxing financial uh, financial sector, briefly those who have more uh, economic leverage and those who are, have more uh, economic uh, power that should uh, contribute to the crises, uh, not just to put the burden on uh, of, uh, of reform on uh, on those who. Uh, who are vulnerable and poor uh, just because maybe they don't have the power or the leverage to lobby for their interests. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mahinor. Uh, Mohammed, I, you know, you have long advocated on behalf of disabled individuals in the Arab world, and recently there has been uh, increasing emphasis on creating inclusive and participatory societies in the region. So how do you view issues of inclusion and accountability in the Arab world today. <coughs> Thank you, Josh. Uh, I have to say this is not an easy question to answer. Uh, considering the complexity of the concept as well as the practice of inclusion uh, at the global level and how it is being um, brought into the Arab region considering the, uh, the political transition that's taking place there. Um, before I answer the question, I would like to briefly ad address some of the contextual aspects uh, for the practice of inclusion in the Arab world. Um, from our experience working in Lebanon uh, and uh, the Arab region with other grassroots organizations concerned with issues of inclusion and accessibility, uh, as two main uh, elements toward uh, fulfilling the rights of persons with disabilities. We've realized that uh, persons with disabilities in the Arab world, as, lo as like as uh, many other, re I mean, all other regions in the world, particularly in Global South, have been the uh, most undermined group um, in the in the in this in this part of the world, 
And if we look at the reports um, issued by World, the World Bank and the United Nations, particularly the recent report, World Report on Disability, um, it's stated there that at least 15 to 20 percent of the overall population of the world is of persons with disabilities. In a region like the Middle East and North Africa that's been going through lots of political and security turmoils, um, starting from the uh, Arab-Israeli conflict in 1948 and before, the number of persons with disabilities increased tremendously. In a country like Lebanon that experienced 15 years of civil war, also the population of persons with disabilities has increased tremendously and with the going on with the ongoing um, security issues with with uh, Israel and now with the Syrian uh, conflict also the number of persons with disabilities is increasing considering uh, I mean if we want to add also the um, uh, population component of Syrian and Palestinian refugees from the beginning uh, the Lebanese physical handicapped Union um, has advocated for the integration of issues and rights of persons with disabilities on the agenda of human rights and development. Um, why, why is that? Because we've, we've realized that when talking about inclusion and accessibility, the main focus by uh, international organizations, especially those that uh, work in the field of uh, aid operations have completely focused their uh, interest and operations on issues of political inclusion and accessibility. While the issue of social inclusion and accessibility has been somehow undermined. We try to um, promote this idea uh, uh, seeing that the uh, process today toward inclusion and accessibility in the Arab world is still lacking the systematic approach uh, for uh, pursuing a rather universal uh, 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 mechanisms uh, toward ensuring the inclusion of um, vulnerable groups, uh, mainly persons with disabilities, women, youth, and children uh, in the uh, overall platform of a socioeconomic inclusion, meaning that uh, we it's it's a necessary approach to tackle issues and needs for those who would who are, for instance, in Lebanon, form 85 percent of the population of persons with disabilities who have no jobs, and 15 percent of those of persons with disabilities. I mean. Uh, only 4% of them has received education of various levels. So this, this is, is still a, a, sh a shameful um, number or percentage uh, in, a, in, a, in a region where we are so proud of having uh, the highest rate of uh, reserve of oil, but we have nothing toward serving the uh, population of persons with disabilities and other vulnerable groups. Um, so I, I, I think um, there is a need to address these issues. Uh, we are so uh, hopeful that uh, with the political transition and with the rising of persons with disabilities in countries like Egypt, Tunisia, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, where we see persons with disabilities and their organizations are effectively involved with the political transition and, and peoples rising uh, in these countries to uh, have uh, their rights recognized in the, in the new constitutional reforms in these countries. So uh, I urge all inter organizations, U.S.-based organizations, particularly those that uh, those who are involved somehow directly or indirectly with uh, usually when we talk about the US Arab uh, affairs we, we, we mainly talk about aid and funding 
So those who are who are helping uh, the political transition in the Arab world not to only think of inclusion and accessibility as um, an only political issue. There is a tremendous need to focus on socioeconomic issues because when we see more inclusivity uh, practiced toward vulnerable groups, we can have a rather safe and pluralistic society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. And uh, of course, within the smorgasbord of issues that we're covering today, finally, we get to Syria. So, Rana, you know, uh, Syrian civil society has really been heavily overshadowed by the militarization of the conflict. Uh, I want to ask you, um, from your perspectives, what are the dynamics and role of civil society in Syria today? What, what is the state of civil society today in Syria? Okay, I'd, I'd actually like to, uh, to start with a question. Um, how many in this room have heard of the campaign uh, Stop the Killing, We Want to Build a Homeland for All Syrians? Three people out of the entire room. Um, the campaign started with an individual um, move by a young lady uh, in front of the People's uh, Parliament uh, wearing red and writing this phrase and then it started to a big peaceful campaign for, for peace for all Syrians. Um, if I'm going to ask the other question, how many have read about um, militarized developments in Syria? Almost, almost the entire room. Uh, so practically, the media is not interested in civil society, although uh, most likely if there's going to be any political transition, proper transition based on notions of democracy, human rights, citizenship, it's most likely that the civil society will be called upon. Uh, so, so this deserves further, further um, focus. Uh, what's the civil society in Syria doing today? And the answer is they're doing extraordinary things. Um, possibly I don't have the time to give the the background of civil society in Syria, why it's weak, why it's fragmented, why do we have a lot of fanatic groups coming in, but um, because, because there's no, uh, not a lot of coverage by the media, I can tell you part of the things civil society is doing, uh, they're doing um, conflict resolution campaigns, uh, they're holding lessons and schools for school students, and uh, this is counting the number that one official number says that one out of five students in Syria are, are out of school for the past two years. And we can see the reflection on this, on, on peace in, the, in Syria and in the region too. Uh, they're, they're supporting health centers, they're becoming doctors, and actually uh, this is very risky in the country. Uh, they're offering legal services, treating the victims of rape, uh, because you know, in any conflict, usually it's uh, it's the bodies of especially women are used as war tools, um, raising awareness on on uh, how how to how people can be sheltered. Uh, they're doing cultural events, and that's very important. Uh, they're establishing local administration uh, committees and counseling councils. They're providing humanitarian aid. They're documenting abuses. Um, they're, they're fostering nonviolence. They're doing a lot of great things uh, in a time that the security situation is extremely bad. They can be detained for this, and they can be detained for this from uh, both conflicting sides, by the way. Um, uh, people have been, uh, um, have been um, facing a lot of difficulties, and still they're motivated and interested to work. How do they work? It's non-centered leadership. Uh, like circles of civil society activists uh, work together. They use social media. Uh, they have trust circles, and and most important is the dedication and motivation. However, uh, a key element to that is most of them work illegally, uh, because by law, civil society has been treated 
uh, as an enemy to the um, previously. So uh, even the legislation, it has three key factors, which is a lot of meddling with the establishing of civil society institutions. Although within the past decade, uh, from only a handful of civil society organization and charities, uh, around 900, uh, 900 were established. However, most of them were charities, and they were more focused on providing charity. For instance, uh, when the liberalization on the fuel subsidies came in 2007, um, civil society organization, they rallied to lessen the repercussions rather than advocating against that policy that harmed a lot of, a lot of people. Um, so, so we can see that legal, legal uh, challenge uh, with the Syrian civil society. Again, they cannot take funding because you can imp be imprisoned for taking funding, external funding. Uh, there's a lot of meddling, not only with their establishing and li licenses, but in their operation as well. Uh, so a lot of, um, uh, a lot of ne uh, donors ne need to take this into consideration. They cannot be registered. Uh, another, very big, um, um, another very big challenge is the sanctions. Uh, sanctions usually, um, they do not, they, they might have some positive, uh, their positive thought effects, but on the civil society, what's actually happened is civil society is not open to open bank accounts, and I'm not speaking, it's in the US, it's in Europe, it's worldwide. Syrians in general, they're being uh, punished for being Syrian. So, uh, so uh, any bank, any money transfer to civil society organization is extremely troublesome. Um, another another key challenge is the technical abilities, because there was no uh, development sector in the country. Previously, there were a, hand, a handful of NGOs that started in 2006, 2007, uh, and of uh, government NGOs. Uh, there was some technical uh, capacities given to uh, to different uh, development workers. However, these are not not many. So we we need to take this technical ability aspect. And the third thing, despite their creativity and, um, and uh, flexibility, one of the biggest challenges is actually um, uh, they're not strategic. They're, they're forced to be involved, to focus on the direct needs of the people, on the humanitarian situation, and uh, to be less focused on a longer term vision. And the situation is forcing that on civil society. Uh, so. Um, that's one of the biggest challenges for the civil society, and I'll give you the ground. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, you know, at this point, I'd like to turn to Nidal Bitari, who is joining us today from the floor. He is a member of the ANND delegation. And uh, to Nidal, I'd like to address the question about um, the situation of uh, Palestinians and Palestinian refugees uh, living in Syria. Now, today, we hear mostly about Syrian refugees. But the situation facing the, some, the nearly 500,000 Palestinian refugees uh, in Syria is particularly dire and, and worrisome. Many Palestinian families are, um, in Syria are facing uh, secondary displacement, forced to flee from their homes uh, yet again or a second time. Uh, so Nidal, what are the conditions uh, currently facing Palestinian refugees in Syria? And also, what is the situation of those uh, forced to flee to, to neighboring countries and elsewhere? Okay. Thank you, Joshua. Hi, I'm Nidal Bitari. I'm, uh, actually, I'm Syrian-Palestinian, you know. And so I'm a double refugee <laughs> also. So. And regarding the Syrian-Palestinian refugees in Syria now, there are about 500,000 Syrian-Palestinian exists and spread in about 20, uh, uh, 20 uh, or 12, uh, uh, 12 camps in Syria. And uh, the biggest one is in Damascus. It's uh, Al Yarmouk camp. Al Yarmouk camp is now blockaded since about um, seven, seven months. And uh, the regime is not uh, is preventing to enter the, the assistant, the medical assistant, the, f the relief to, uh, to uh, the camp. Okay, this is not the question. The question is related to all the Palestinian uh, case. What is the future of Palestinian refugees in this within the context of the, the, uh, the Arab uprisings? Now, for 
you know that uh, the history of Palestinians, uh, they have in their memories, their, uh, their, uh, their memory in, in Lebanon and then in Iraq. You know now, the Palestinian Iraqi refugees, until now, there is a, a camp between, uh, in the borders between Syria and, uh, and Iraq, Al Hol refugees, uh, Al Hol camp uh, refugees. Until now, there is no solution for them. They are stuck on the borders, uh, and they are really facing the risk of being killed because of the clashes between the regime and, uh, uh, and the rebels in Syria. Uh, the second point is, what is the rule of UNORWA? UNORWA is, the, 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 the mission of UNORWA is limited to just uh, work and relief. So what about protection? You know that w now when the Palestinian flee from Syria to neighborhood, or, uh, already the the only, the only place which they can reach is Lebanon. And uh, recently, the Lebanese government uh, uh, took a decision that to prevent Palest Syrian Palestinians to to enter Lebanon. Okay, when they go to Lebanon, when they used to go to Lebanon before this decision, they tried to to register, but you know that. Norwa doesn't have a protection section. So it's important now to, to, to raise a demand that there should be a protection section for these refugees. Now they are, when they, go, when they went to, uh, and they are going now to UNHCR, which, have, uh, which has a, uh, a protection section, they said to them, we are not responsible, that you are under the responsibility of Norwa. So this is a problematic issue between UNORWA and UNHCR. And regarding the policies of the governments of in the neighborhoods, you know that the Jordanian government refused to host any Syrian Palestinian refugees. And I remember that the, uh, the deputy of uh, Mr. Pankimon uh, Amos, she was in, uh, in Jordan in a Zaatari camp. And she could hear the, the sound of clashes between the regime and, uh, and the rebels when the Jordanian government on the borders were, were pushing back the Syrian Palestinian refugees and putting them under the risk of being killed because of this, uh, the, 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 the clashes between the rebels and, uh, uh, and the, the regime. So, the, and this, the third point the refugees point is related to the negotiations between uh, Israel and Palestine. What is the future? This is the key question for refugees. What is the future of the refugees, of the Palestinian refugees, and these negotiations? Thank you, Joshua. Thank you very much, Nidal. At this point, uh, before I turn to the audience, I'd like to start a broader discussion of civil society views toward U.S. policy specifically. Um, and I think i uh, start on the economic angle. So, uh, Kinda, wondering if you can uh, just present uh, your views of the economic partnerships, the state of economic partnerships between Arab countries and the United States. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, it's good to start with the economics because uh, many times the uh, spaces for discussing uh, the uh, economic dimension of the relationship get lost uh, when the emergencies uh, such as uh, Syria and uh, the Palestinian negotiations, etc., are on the agenda. But from our perspective, the, uh, the future of the region as well, including the sustainability of any uh, uh, political solution as well as any democratic uh, uh, practice in the region is also rooted in finding the right answers on the economic front. So this is why it is always important for us, even though we are finding less and, uh, and lesser spaces to discuss this with policymakers in Congress, for example, uh, etc. We still insist that this is an issue that needs to be highlighted from now, and uh, because it will shape the uh, uh, the possibilities in the in the future. So, on the economic front, there are several 
main uh, areas where the U.S. and Arab countries uh, engage. Trade and investment, very obvious. There is also the financial assistance and the development assistance, especially through uh, U.S. aid. There is also the uh, debt issues between U.S. and Arab countries, which um, took a certain uh, kind of uh, uh, discussion in light of the 2011 revolutions, but then uh, was uh, 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 marginalized. And also uh, uh, there is the broader role of the United uh, States in, the, uh, 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 in leading or in designing the role of the international financial institutions. So the representation of the United States inside institutions like the International Monetary Fund, inside institutions like the World Bank and in shaping their policies towards the region is also, we perceive it as a very important front for discussion. I want to confine my notes to the issue of trade and investment and a little bit on the uh, role within the international financial institutions. So basically in 2011, uh, the United States um, initiated uh, uh, a step towards Arab countries under the uh, title uh, Trade and Investment uh, Partnership Initiative. And this was an initiative which uh, aims through uh, uh, enhancing trade and investment to support transitions in the Arab countries. And basically it had four main components to it. One is increasing the trade and investment integration between the US and Arab countries. Second Second, to support the trade and investment integration among Arab countries themselves. Third, there was the uh, uh, track of working on pushing certain reforms for regulations and uh, uh, um, rules related to the area of trade and, uh, and investment. And fourth was working on enhancing the cooperation between the U.S. and the European Union on uh, in regards to their trade and investment relations with Arab countries. These are the four main uh, pillars of this initiative, w which was uh, uh, designed by the Obama administration. And this initiative is now part of the U.S. Uh, 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 program or or uh, what the U.S. Uh, presents under the broader uh, G8 uh, uh, initiative towards the region, which is named the Deauville Partnership because it was launched in the French city of Deauville. So, uh, so the U.S. works on this alone, uh, uh, but, uh, but also under this broader G8 initiative called the uh, uh, Deauville uh, Partnership. So the main question that is being asked here from centers uh, and research centers that are discussing this issue and and also back in the Arab countries is about the uh, uh, merits of this initiative uh, uh, and its uh, ability to respond to the short-term and long-term uh, needs in our uh, uh, that, uh, that the Arab countries uh, are uh, facing. So basically, to understand a little bit the role of trade and investment, we need to uh, uh, highlight a, a, a bit what are the challenges of the economies of the Arab countries. Arab countries have undergone gone since the 80s and open uh, 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 market policies and economic liberalization approach whereby they were uh, very much engaged in liberalizing uh, uh, trade and also in uh, entering into a lot of investment uh, and investment protection agreements globally. To give you an example, for example, Egypt has more than 100 bilateral investment treaties, among them one with the United States. Uh, uh, Morocco and uh, Tunisia has more than 50. So they are active. It's not that they have been a, a, a conservative in terms of economic policy making. But what we have seen is that the way trade and investment ha policies have been used and the way other policies have been used, including finance and uh, uh, production policies, did not allow them to build economies that are growing and providing the employment needed in the region. And this is why we uh, have been always saying that the economic challenge and the economic stress has been core to defining the revolutions. So just to give you the main things we look, uh, we consider when looking at the economies of our countries, we, con we, uh, we, we, we try to uh, highlight that these economies have significantly 
lost their productive capacities, their ability to manufacture and export, their ability to uh, engage their citizenship in employment in the manufacturing sector, in agriculture, and in uh, uh, highly skilled jobs in the services sector, for example. They lost that. They witnessed jobless growth. They were growing, but they were not able to create jobs. They witnessed uh, uh, regress in the ability to pay fair wages to the uh, uh, to the workers, what we call depression of wages or the regress of wages and income as a percentage of the global uh, 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 income of the uh, production of the economy or the gross domestic product of the economy. So this reflects how the economy was uh, being um, uh, diverge away from serving the rights of the citizens because you are not giving them jobs, you are not giving them uh, uh, fair wages, and towards concentration in uh, uh, for the interests of the uh, few. And we've seen a weakening and a, a thinning of the middle class, and I think we all understand this phenomena because also in the United States it is. And all of these are a reflection of the economic model that have built and a reflection of how the trade and investment relations uh, that have been uh, built with uh, uh, other countries uh, was not able to serve the developmental needs and the growth needs of the economies. Why? Because we see that the, the liberalization process that was taken uh, in the region was, uh, uh, was not taken at the right moment, was uh, uh, taken at a, uh, at a moment when the economies were still trying to mature and were still trying to, uh, uh, and the uh, and the economies were not able to respond to uh, the global competition in a way that allows them uh, a dynamic integration in the global economy and an integration in the global economies that allows them to continue growing. On the contrary, they uh, witnessed a depressive trend due to the immature uh, and uh, 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 not timely liberalization that they took. This is overall our diagnosis of the situation with the use of trade and investment policies. This is why uh, one of the core questions we put forward uh, uh, when we hear about initiatives uh, uh, such as the U.S. Trade and Investment uh, uh, Partnership Initiative towards the Arab countries is whether we will take this opportunity to assess how the U.S. trade and investment relations thus far have uh, uh, worked for the region and for the U.S. economy before uh, jumping into further uh, 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 agreements and further liberalization, which not, does not necess is not necessarily built on uh, 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 well-studied ground and well-assessed grounds on how to link and how to design these agreements to suit and to address the developmental challenges uh, in the uh, region. Currently, if we look uh, at the current status in 2011, the latest numbers we have, the uh, relationship between the U.S. and Arab countries, less than 5% of the U.S. trade was with Arab countries and less than 1% of the foreign direct investment coming from the United States to the world went to the Arab uh, uh, economies. And this uh, foreign direct investment was uh, uh, basically concentrated around 90% in the oil sector. So you can see that broadly, we were not able to use trade and investment in order to support diversification of the economies in the region. We were not able to use this, uh, these relations in order to support more production in areas that can create employment and that can help integrate citizens in the economic cycles uh, of their uh, countries and thus can help in stabilizing the economies on a track of sustainable growth, uh, uh, sustainable employment generating growth. This is why we, uh, uh, we say that uh, a, a, a better option than, uh, than uh, a quick an easy answer uh, to, uh, to this issue is to uh, wait and see 
what uh, will happen in the region and also use this waiting period to assess what is currently in place of trade and investment relations in the uh, in the Arab countries. So uh, use this time where the e economies and the institutions of the Arab countries are still not uh, uh, stable enough, institutions are not yet in place, uh, uh, elections are uh, uh, not fully uh, uh, achieved, in order to assess the implications on economies, on developmental indicators, including wages, including uh, uh, production, including uh, um, uh, people's income, and to try to uh, 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 build a dialogue which uh, around trade and investment, which bring forward more voices from the uh, uh, direct stakeholders in this area. So unions, for example, civil society organizations that work on economic policies and economic and social rights in the region, and try to expand the scope of discussion from only uh, 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 governmental authorities and trade uh, uh, and investment authorities in the countries to also listen to the direct stakeholders that are workers in the industries that are being affected and also the businesses of the uh, that are uh, operating in the region the specifically the small and medium enterprises which are, i think are a priority on the agenda of everyone just to note something that there is there is, uh, uh, there is enough declarations and uh, good words in terms of supporting small and medium enterprises. You see it in all the, uh, uh, the reports. But when it comes to actually designing policies that work for small and medium enterprises and involving small and medium enterprises in the design of policies, this is, we are very far from that. Because basically, we still see that the trade and investment policies are designed by, uh, uh, based on the agenda of big business only. Unions and small med and medium enterprises are not on the table. Uh, and and uh, one uh, uh, priority on the way forward, and if really we want to achieve the objective that we declare for this trade and investment partnership, uh, uh, which is uh, supporting the living standards of the people in the region and supporting the stabilization of the economies of the, in the region, we need to take time to broaden the dialogue and to broaden the stakeholders involved in the design of the uh, of the new rules or the that will uh, 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 that will set in place new investment and trade uh, 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 relations with the uh, between the two sides. Just to end, uh, there is enough also alternatives if we want to think about the supporting uh, in the short term the economies of the region, uh, taking into consideration that often. Trade and investment agreements, meaning new treaties that are designed as binding treaties and binding obligations under international law, do not accrue uh, uh, benefits in the short term. These are treaties which their benefits and their implications, negative or positive, uh, come to light in the medium term and in the longer term. But if we are thinking about economies of the region, they need uh, short term support. And in, in terms of trade and investment, there are several uh, possibilities for the U.S. administration and officials to, uh, to consider. One, for example, on the uh, uh, trade front is, for example, uh, to, uh, to expand the preferences uh, that are uh, uh, provided for traders from the Arab countries for access to the U.S. market. There is a very strong uh, 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 system of preferences that that the U.S. have designed for a lot of countries. Many Arab countries benefit as well from the generalized system of preferences that is in place. But there is a cons uh, there is possibilities for widening this uh, uh, these preferences for uh, traders from the Arab countries in the uh, short term and for a temporary uh, uh, period. There is also on the investment front uh, the uh, the possibility of. 
promoting and guaranteeing the investments of the uh, U.S. companies in the Arab uh, 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 markets and providing guarantees for uh, U.S. Uh, companies would help them nurture more uh, uh, investments and also would help them uh, go uh, and uh, be, uh, take um, be uh, entrepreneuring or take entrepreneurship uh, steps in uh, sectors which haven't been served by the foreign indirect investment which have been coming from the U.S., uh, sectors which are more productive sectors and employment generating uh, sectors. And here I want to just give a footnote that bilateral investment treaties, which are usually used as uh, the main tools to support uh, investment because they are treaties that are focused on protecting the investor abroad have been showing a lot of problematics uh, lately. And I think there's an alive discussion inside the United States on the model of US uh, bilateral investment treaty that, uh, 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 that is designed by the US administration because the problem in these treaties have been basically twofold. One, that they have focused on the protection of the investor only without uh, uh, also balancing that with respect responsibilities for the investor. So they, ha they have been abused in some sense, and also they have been given, uh, giving the investor a blanket right to take uh, uh, states uh, to uh, arbitration, to sue the state basically in uh, under international uh, uh, commercial, um, uh, I mean international uh, arbitration. And this investor state dispute settlement mechanism have been very problematic for a lot of uh, uh, states, including developing countries countries and advanced countries. So an alternative would be here guaranteeing, giving guarantees to the U.S. investor and helping them access to the market, the Arab market in a protected uh, and guaranteed way as well. Another also uh, uh, possibility of uh, short-term support is to think more about the debt audits and the debt relief uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the Arab countries. And this is very important on both fronts. One, the debt relief itself, which would give a lot of fis direct fiscal space for Arab countries to use their budgets more uh, 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 actively in addressing social and economic challenges in the region, especially that some countries are paying more than 20% of their uh, uh, budgets, uh, uh, allocating them to servicing debts, not only the U.S. debts, but other debts, but also because the U.S. stands on that audits and that relief is very important to attract other countries to do that and as well to uh, help Arab countries to make the case with other uh, 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 advanced economies on uh, the debt audit and the debt relief issues. So these are short-term alternatives that also we would like to see more discussed inside the uh, policy making circles of the US, but also the more think tanks address these issues in DC and the more uh, 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 voice uh, in the media around these issues is taking place, the more these become uh, uh, possible policy responses that the uh, authorities uh, also take into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, you know, we in the U.S. are so preoccupied with the news of the day, you know, the headlines regarding political violence and civil strife that we often lose sight of, you know, these uh, broader contours of U.S. trade and economic relations with the Middle East. So thank you very much, Kinda, for that discussion. Uh, now I want to turn to um, Mehi Noor. Um, it, you know, if we could just briefly describe or discuss uh, Egyptian-U.S. relations, uh, perhaps through this lens, because, you know, with with respect to Egypt, we're so focused on democracy and U.S. foreign assistance and political violence that, you know, are we missing anything? And if so, what are we missing and how would you, how would you assess relations? Okay. Um, well, I think we, uh, I, I, I will start from uh, June 30 or uh, what is, uh, what is uh, or maybe a day that is more uh, highlighted in the U.S.-Egyptian uh, uh, relations is uh, July 3rd. We see a lot of uh, news agencies uh, speaking about uh, the Egyptian coup 
and and uh, and then consequently we can uh, uh, we can understand or or, or, or see the U.S. foreign uh, re relations uh, in terms of issues like aid and so and how they are uh, transforming or being questioned today. Just to preempt a question from the audience, I mean. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think that um, this this direction is uh, ha has been a bit problematic and has been uh, making uh, the U.S. administration uh, lose a lot of uh, popular support uh, among uh, the Egyptian uh, average uh, man or woman uh, because it does not uh, go back again to. Um, what happened before July uh, 3rd, for example? I mean, uh, July 3rd did not uh, pop up into uh, into no context. I mean, uh, it was uh, preceded by June 30, which was uh, one year, uh, an, an, no, anniversary, if that's the proper term to call it, of uh, uh, the Brotherhood uh, power in, uh, in Egypt, which has uh, seen... Um, um, uh, economic and social uh, policies that were contrary to the dreams and the hopes of uh, the Egyptian people that took out to the street in 2011. So um, I think uh, uh, focusing on the uh, politicization of uh, June uh, June 3rd on, uh, on being a coup or, or not a coup takes out um, the what, what uh, po past governments have uh, have uh, have done to the dreams of the people and whether they have answered to them uh, or, uh, or 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 not uh, in fact uh, what we should also be looking at is uh, part of what kinda has uh, more broadly uh, alluded to is what uh, economic um, and development approaches that not just the U.S. but other uh, political and economic superpowers have been fostering in the region and in Egypt specifically. I mean, um, very unpopular uh, was the uh, International Monetary Fund's approach to how to solve uh, the economic uh, crisis uh, in uh, that has been framed as a as a as a as a. A repercussion of the revolution, but has further um, roots back into the international financial crisis and the economic development that Kinda has spoken how the how it went generally in the region. Uh, so, for example, um, it's it uh, it just pops to my mind how when uh, Secretary uh, of State John Kerry was in Egypt to speak on uh, the on the on the political. Uh, uh, higher the the political uh, problems before uh, June 30 was preceded. I mean, everybody was saying that you know the people will take out on the one uh, one year anniversary of Morsi in power if he does not start um, taking into consideration uh, political as well as uh, as well as economic uh, inclusion of the people. Uh, there was uh, John Kerry was in Egypt and he uh, made it clearly how he thought it was important for Egypt to take uh, on the IMF loan with its uh, policy recommendations, that uh, further uh, aggravate the, the economic and social um, disempowerment of, uh, of, uh, of the Egyptians. So these are issues that we need to, to take in mind. I mean, uh, I don't know how much is the audience familiar with what uh, IMF recommendations come uh, with a loan, but it, it's pretty much a quick fix to an economic crisis based on uh, austerity uh, measures, and that has been uh, and any, any social uh, mitigation or safeguard to uh, uh, the effects of, of such policies on the people have been uh, very hastily uh, done and did not uh, rely on sufficient data or understanding of the country or, or the regions. I mean, we've heard from the World Bank, which uh, I mean, one of the top contributors to either the World Bank or the IMF is the US, and we need to think of the US role of, uh, as, as a government and as treasury, for example, in those institutions. One of the ways to mitigate uh, 
negative effects of an institutions like the IMF policy recommendations was a social safety net equivalent of 240 Egyptian uh, pounds cash transfers per person per year, which is equivalent to nine pennies <laughs> for each person uh, per, uh, per day. So, um, so these these are uh, these are uh, policies that we uh, need to uh, to to look at when we when we think of U.S. Uh, role uh, in in the region, uh, not just to look at the political uh, uh, front in in the manner that it was uh, that it was uh, taken by. Thank you, Mahinor. Um, now, right before I open it up uh, to questions, uh, very briefly, um, Mohammed and and Rana. Wondering if each of you could could touch on um, you know the issue of of how the U.S. can better assist uh, civil society organizations uh, in the Middle East. Ron, if you could address um, the, the case of Syria, of course, and Mohammed, if you could um, maybe discuss how USAID can be and other aid agencies, how their role can be enhanced in bolstering civil society. Excellent. Um, <coughs> answering this question. Um, make me uh, borrow uh, so, uh, one, one thing from uh, Akinda's excellent presentation about the uh, uh, look, I mean, when we look at the level of uh, trade and investment uh, through the Arab-American uh, relations, we see that uh, this is mostly focusing on oil. Um, social inclusion has also an economic uh, aspect. Um, both uh, through the lens of investment as well as through the overall uh, outcome on society. Uh, I think s uh, U.S. Uh, foreign aid agencies, uh, including USAID and other ones, should recognize the um, cost, uh, uh, the, the cost effectiveness of social inclusion for marginalized groups, particularly persons with disabilities. Um, this is uh, may a main um, uh, perspective that we've developed through our experience at the Lebanese Physical Handicap Union, working with uh, different stakeholders in the Lebanese society as well as in the region. Um, because when we uh, ensure that one group of people that rep represents a 15 to 20 percent of the population is not uh, any longer considered as a burden, but rather a partner and effective uh, el a key player in the process of socioeconomic development. I think uh, we cannot disagree or and we cannot dispute anymore the effectiveness and the, the essentiality of inclusion and accessibility for this group of people. Um, I think one of the major issues uh, we, we've been experiencing is because, and I'm not going to dwell into this because th what I'm going to say now deserves uh, uh, extensive and comprehensive PhD dissertations, which is the issue of supply and demand, which we uh, are focusing or concentrating, concentrating our economic model on mostly. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. aid agencies uh, have been pretty much uh, inspired by the ongoing uh, political uh, changes in the region. And uh, this is why we see every year or every new term or cycle of funding uh, the focus and the purpose as well as the objective, strategic objectives of these uh, programs change frequently. Um, this is why, uh, although these programs insist that uh, civil society organizations in the Arab world must uh, identify ways for sustained for sustaining its development efforts, uh, and in the same time, while we see these uh, these in, uh, civil society organizations have no other sources but to rely on foreign aid programs, I think this is a, bi a, a, a big problematic issue. Um, we need to see a rather sustainable vision uh, toward ensuring an inclusive uh, socioeconomic policies uh, funded 
by the you know, the by U.S. foreign aid uh, uh, foreign aid agencies. Plus, we need to see. Um, w this is one of the things that we've experienced through our work as well, both uh, with different agencies uh, from of the U.S., like uh, National Democratic Institute. International F uh, Foundation for Electoral System, IFIS, and IREX, other and other ones. Um, those who have encouraged uh, our efforts toward uh, maintaining and establishing effective partnership with other civil society uh, stakeholders um, and building network networks and alliances, especially with private sector, to make sure that every single entity within society is being engaged with promoting and adopting policies toward inclusion for marginalized groups at the social at the social and economic level um, the other thing is we need to see a rather uh, interest to be uh, inspired uh, for or uh, or by the u.s foreign aid agencies toward enhancing an interregional collaboration and partnership between civil society organizations and I'm saying this based on one fact. Uh, usually, the attitude uh, we get from uh, U.S. foreign aid agencies is that people in the region and and their civil society representatives lack experience. This is why we need to give them training. We need to train them on how to become more transparent. We need to train them more on uh, leadership. We need to train them more on op options of organizational development. This is excellent, but this is not everything. Uh, civil society organizations have at least the most important experience and expertise regarding the context of the region. One of the main issues that we've been struggling with, uh, particularly with the World Bank, is that the focus is always toward governments. Uh, and... This is why we refrain uh, from, or the World Bank refrain from, refrains from imposing conditionalities on on the uh, 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 lending uh, programs. Uh, this is uh, we are not we're not disputing the the issue of conditionality here. We're disputing the fact that at least there is a minimum standard for respecting human rights and inclusive development uh, criteria to ensure that socioeconomic development are, uh, uh, policies are inclusive. Uh, and we, the other thing is I would like to emphasize, I know I'm speaking very fast and uh, maybe my, my ideas are cutting short. Um, we see double standards in, in the U.S. foreign aid policy toward the region. Uh, while the U.S. Uh, pushes civil society organizations in countries that experience the highest rate of poverty like Egypt, Yemen, uh, Northern African countries, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, uh, we see th w and, and push them to adopt policies toward inclusion and human rights and transparency. We don't see that being uh, practiced toward countries that, uh, that the United States concentrates its trade efforts towards like the Saudi Arabia, Qatar. And why, why is that? Why don't we see m more transparency pushed by uh, toward these countries or for uh, within these countries? Um, so we we want to see more systematic uh, and visionary policy by U.S. aid foreign agencies uh, toward enhancing a systematic uh, and overall overarching inter regional and interregional uh, approach toward inclusion and 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 and, and socioeconomic development. So, um, I, I'm, I mean, of course, we can, we can talk more uh, during the QA and session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Rana? Thanks. Actually, Mohammed spoke my mind on, on the case of civil society and the need to support it. Um, but, but to add to that, um, what's happening, the case that's happening with Syria is, so now we have the government and we have the uh, opposition to speak to, and usually we mix the opposition for civil society, so they're, they're usually seen as one chunk. Uh, but this is not the case. Civil society is uh, an entity on its own, and um, it and uh, the different other stakeholders, they perceive their interests 
and their role differently. So we need to include civil society in peace talks. Uh, I mean, chairs at negotiating tables should not be uh, uh, reserved exclusively to men with the weapons. And we hardly see any uh, civil society uh, members in peace talks. Uh, we need we do need to include it in, in all actually um, interventions. I know a lot of uh, support, financial support is going and technical support is going to uh, civil society. Uh, but I've mentioned the issue of sanction and and how it needs to be uh, studied again to see how it the negative impact it has on civil society. And, uh, and the work it's doing and how it's paving the way to, to more fanatic groups who have unlimited funding at time and they are, uh, as, in, as in the case with the courts, they are being to have police on, in the grounds in, in the northern areas and they're more able to, to apply their own law uh, rather than uh, the civil, civil courts. Uh, I mean, they're even they're even spreading their own ideologies in Syria. Now we have around five curriculums <laughs> of the different sides. So so you can see how fragmented things have become, and simply because uh, the civil and the civil society they do not have enough funds to work uh, conflict resolution trainings. They've taken the skills to work on. Uh, uh, to work on uh, their own projects, to work on their SMEs because people are hungry. And, and often we're omitting that people need to work. Uh, we need to, um, even humanitarian aid, it needs to be thought of in a more sustainable manner rather than just injecting amounts of money uh, within the easiest, most accessible civil society groups on the borders or outside just to to check that this project has been has been implemented um uh, the other recommendation is uh, violence is not the solution and i'm speaking of military violence and i'm speaking of economic violence um uh, speaking i mean um any action must be viewed through the length of what will hap- uh, what could lead to a just and lasting peace, and not to uh, reiterate that again and again. Uh, economically, uh, economically speaking, I will not repeat what my colleagues just said about people did not go on the streets for austerity measures. They did not go out for for the current IMF recipe. They they. They've wanted more social and economic rights. So, so uh, those shock therapies are not the solution. Um, uh, again, the U.S. Can, can do a lot in terms of decreasing violence. Uh, they can stop the flow of weapons. They, they can, uh, they can uh, start withdrawing support for armed actors and engaging other countries in the process. Uh, they can exert a lot of pressure on countries. Uh, including civil society by itself is a very good uh, strategy. Um, and last but not least, um, I want to speak about the um, the media focus, uh, where the media is all focusing is on the arming, is on the military, is on the fighting, and hardly any uh, mention of what civil society is doing on its own um, is ever taken into, uh, into consideration, although there are a lot of uh, Syrian uh, citizen journalists trying to reflect that to the world, but media are not interested in buying these pieces of news from them. They're not interested in supporting that. So again, we need to push into uh, wanting to hear more uh, on what's being done. Um, there are a lot of other interventions th- uh, th- that can include safe havens, humanitarian corridors, establishment of uh, war crimes tribunals, um, just to name a few. Thank you, Rana. Now, because time is short, I would like to open it up to the audience. Um, so in addition to stating your name and affiliation, if you could just please keep it to a brief question. Thank you. In the front. Uh, Cody Akavian, Sorry for the microphone. I'm quite loud. So <laughs> Thank you.
Um, my question was for Kinda, and I also wanted to open up to the rest of the audience. You spoke about different aspects of trade, liberalization, and all these different ways in which we could access the Middle East and so forth. One thing that I don't think you touched on too much, but the other people did, was the intersection of economics and military. Now, in the case of Egypt, um, trade, liberalization, economic, IMF, every Washington consensus on down the line, uh, even before June 30th and even before 2011, I've uh, just simply reordered the patronage systems in a new way. I see that case in Syria as well with different situations. If economic situations shift, politics and the patron, you know, there's a patronage politics shift. So my question is, can you get into this a little more deeply and talk about the developmental challenges that civil society faces in the case of Egypt when you have a military that's not just firing bullets on the street, but owns the economy, effectively owns the bloated state structure, and where does civil society fit into that? And I wanted to open that up to everybody else and to talk about their own specific cases, because I know Syria is a different case in how civil society operates than in Egypt. Um, thank you. Thank you. Kenda, could you uh, begin addressing? Now, or we take a couple of questions? Um, in the oh, we could take a couple of more, yeah, in the front. Good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Sekiro. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflict resolution and violence prevention here in the district. I'm, a, I'm from Africa, I'm from Kenya. And uh, I'm also an, a businesswoman and a entrepreneur doing in in international business consulting. Looking at your speeches, I want to thank you so much because you are coming from the grassroots. That is where the advocacy needs to start because you understand the ground, you know what is happening, and you have brought the message here in the United St in the United States. See me as a civil society. How do we work together? Because I've always participated in events like Egypt, marching, advocating White House, and everywhere. But after that, you don't see anybody again. You don't see where everybody went. So how do we work together as civil society, based here in the U.S. and you on the ground over there? Because we need an impact, despite of where we come from. Violence is violence. Crime is crime. Terrorism, as you hear, is those are our children. We are we who we are. So if we don't change that as civil society, as mothers and others. So I just want to know, how do we collaborate to work together as from here to the White House, to the Congress, and everywhere to make this? Because if we don't voice a civil society, I just finished the, uh, the World Bank IMF annual meeting. I was there. We talk every year, we talk every time we talk, we coming saying the same story. How do we make the impact of violence, conflicts, uh, investment? Because as he said, investment cannot be where there is war, where there is no peace. There has to be peace and uh, resolutions to, for investment or businesses to be done. So how do we do that and make that happen? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question in the back. Yes, yes. I'm Helen Rafael with Resources for the Future. Uh, apart from petroleum products, what specific economic sectors would have comparative advantage so that if we helped with investment, they would be competitive in the world market with, for example, products from China that are <laughs> spreading all over the world? Where, where are the products, the specific sectors, you talked about economic sectors, but you didn't name any. What specific sectors would be particularly advantageous for the Arab countries to invest in? Thank you. I think, um, Kinda, you're well placed to address the questions on the uh, intersection between economies and the military and also perhaps the comparative advantages of economic sectors. Thank you. Uh, thanks for all your questions. I am not sure I am the best person to comment on the economy of the military. Uh, <laughs> but what I can definitely agree with you is what we have seen uh, post the revolutions in the region uh, was a focus on restabilizing the same economic models that were uh, designed under the ousted regimes. This was one of the biggest tasks for the uh, uh, interest groups in, the, the, in these countries, but also one of the biggest tasks for the uh, international 
international financial institutions, as Mahinoor uh, mentioned, and also the uh, partners uh, of the uh, region, the economic uh, partners, uh, including the United States and the European Union. There could be sev uh, different uh, reasons why each uh, uh, party have uh, opted out uh, for prioritizing restabilizing and not actually creating the possibility of redesigning uh, the uh, economic model. Uh, but definitely what you have seen is the, uh, uh, that the uh, focus of the uh, global narrative uh, 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 in regards to the region was that the problem of the economic uh, uh, decay was not in the economic policies themselves, but that they, but the problem was that they were implemented in a context which was lacking democratic governance and uh, 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 fueled by corruption. This was the diagnosis. But according to us, this is a very, uh, 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 it fails, this diagnosis fails to capture the full picture. The full picture is, yes, there was lack of uh, democratic governance and fueled corruption, uh, but the biggest problem as well was that was that the economic choices themselves that were made didn't fit the developmental context in the uh, region and this is why our biggest a challenge now as civil society groups in the region is to secure this space for discussing the economic uh, policies themselves and not only the implementation of economic policies that have been designed previously. And this is why when Mahinur mentioned that the, uh, there was a popular uh, uh, uprising against the IMF uh, uh, negotiations in Egypt, it is because the IMF's recipe is the same recipe that that they came uh, uh, with to the Mubarak uh, uh, regime and to the other regimes. And we have several papers that have monitored the kind of policy advice that came to the region from international financial institutions from before the global crisis 2008 and through 2010 and post the revolutions 2011, and they are still the same. But I agree with you that the, uh, the, uh, the economies in the region need a structural shift and transformation in the way the economies are uh, uh, built, in the role of the state, the role of the private sector, the role of the pri local private sector, and the role of the foreign private sector, the relationship of the state with the private sector through public-private partnerships, etc. These are all big questions that needs to be addressed in the uh, region. But what we are calling for is to avoid the easy answers, which are always that the problem is in the role of the state, that the uh, solution is, is with the private sector. No, because uh, we see that we need much more dynamic answers. Because we had these implemented before, we have distrusted the state fully, and we have over-trusted in the uh, 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 role of the private sector, and we had failed economies that took us to the revolution. What we need now, we need to call for uh, enough policy space in order for the uh, state to play a dynamic role in uh, allowing for uh, 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 an active uh, role of the private sector in also nurturing uh, uh, a space for national private sector to grow and also to build partnership with the foreign private sector, not to be eaten by the foreign private sector and to be mm -hmm. uh, 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 swallowed. So all these questions uh, are up in the air, but I think the question on the role of the military and the economy of the military in Egypt is very specific to Egypt. I hope Mahinur can give you more answers. But within a broader structural transformation of the economy of Egypt, definitely the, uh, the role of the military on this front will, will, will also be uh, changed. In terms of uh, economy, uh, specific uh, sectors, uh, I think it is worthwhile uh, uh, giving it uh, another space also for discussion and also involving voices from the business community 
community and from the producers communities in the region but definitely i tell you the investment policies in the agricultural sector needs to change this is one of the biggest sectors in the region it is one of the sectors that have been marginalized in terms of uh, investment but when investment comes to it in it comes under the umbrella of a land grabbing policy which never uh, not necessarily allows for constructive policy that nurtures the small and medium uh, farmers and nurtures the economic and social uh, rights of these communities we need to have a discussion on this but also as well the uh, the other productive and manufacturing capacities in the arab region is very important Thank you. Uh, Mehinor, if you could uh, expand on, on that theme as well. And unfortunately, I think your comments will be the last uh, because we are running okay. out of time. Thank you. I'll pick on that and I'll also pick on the point of um, common work uh, within civil societies in different regions of the world that suffer similar uh, economic and social uh, deprivations or, or or uh, policies that don't work for the rest of the people. Well, just on... Uh, on um, uh, economy uh, and uh, and militarization. It is true that the that the Egypt that the Egyptian army plays a, a wide role in uh, in the economy in Egypt. Uh, there is a need for for uh, for more the, the discussion and more. Um, transparency, for example, on uh, military uh, budgets, uh, which it has, I mean, they would go into a whole discussion of when and how and why the Egyptian army has gone into uh, uh, to, uh, to become an economic uh, uh, enterprise largely and what that ha does it have to do with the peace process and, and uh, Israeli-Egyptian peace process and whatnot. But not just that, I mean, this is, uh, this is a question. And also another question is, um, the role of the the prominent private sector players in the Egyptian economy and its relationship to the uh, elite sector of uh, of power needs to be questioned, and uh, also openness to towards uh, seeing who was doing business in Egypt, who was successful, uh, on which terms, and what did this do to stealing the resources and uh, and the riches of uh, of the people, and how Egypt uh, became or, or or reached this level of uh, economic and social degradation over over the years and I mean just a, a, a quick example um, I'm, I'm not sure really how after uh, a popular revolution with those economic and social under uh, underlines we still see uh, international financial institutions international uh, development banks like uh, for example the World Bank and the IMF that just had their annuals uh, doing business with tax evaders up until today and we see uh, Egyptian partners being really uh, closely tied to the past uh, circles of uh, of power. I mean, we see uh, doing business with somebody like uh, EFGMS Egypt, for example, which is uh, largely a uh, Mubarak uh, business. Anyhow, so um, on, uh, on 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 common work. Uh, you're right, we need to pick up. I just want to uh, introduce you to something that we're doing actually with um, TGNA uh, or Tax Justice Network Africa. We tackle issues like um, tax justice, um, like for example, issues with tax havens and reforming a tax system in a way that um, that uh, fosters uh, a just redistribution of uh, of wealth. We work with uh, Tax Justice Network Africa, for example, based uh, based uh, in Kenya. Uh, I hear a question on entry points as well. I think we should be lobbying uh, international financial institutions, like here in uh, in, uh, in 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 DC uh, and in their headquarters, to uh, adopt anti-corruption measures, to adopt uh, social policies like what. Uh, Mohammed Lutfi is working on with revising safeguards of World Bank operations on uh, uh, disability uh, issues, for example. We need to be lobbying governments because um, uh, institutions like the World Bank and or the IMF are uh, financial institutions, but they are public institutions, and uh, everyone should be uh, asking before the, the Congress approves uh, for um, um, uh, a budget for those institutions, what economic and social uh, and human rights safeguards does the policies of those institutions have? And we should be, of course, I mean, forming um, um, 
pressure groups at, at home as well, but also on those, all those uh, different uh, fronts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahinor, and thanks to all of our panelists, Annie Dahl. It's not often that we're able to bring together such a diverse group of civil society representatives, so we're very thankful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.